The new generation of console gaming has officially arrived, folks, and I have found myself in the very fortunate position of being able to snag a PS5 and an Xbox Series S at launch. I know, I know, Johnny Big Bollocks over here, but if it makes you feel any better, I do only have one kidney now. With both of these consoles to hand, though, I can finally start diving into the huge catalogue of Xbox games I've missed out on, not to mention all the latest PS5 releases. But before we think about the content opportunities, can we take a moment to appreciate the absolute size of this lad? In fact, here's a couple of size comparisons for you. The Xbox Series S, the PS4, the Nintendo Wii, a biscuit tin, my teeny tiny table Christmas tree, a box set of the greatest TV series ever made, don't at me, a book, another book, a copy of Mad Motors on the PS2, ugh, oh, what the fuck? If you joined me in my last video when we covered Sabrina the Teenage Witch a shit in time, you may remember I mentioned that I seem to be being stalked by Cubix Racing Robots on the PS1. Well, right on its tail, bizarrely, is Wacky Race's Mad Motors on the PS2, which is the second most visited article on my personal blog. Turns out there's quite a hunger for Wacky Race's content, because the review I made on the PS1 game is still one of my most popular videos. And to be honest, I don't quite understand why, given that that review was... This game is nuttier than a squirrel's food supply. Terrible. But between those two reviews, I feel like I've started to develop a reputation for covering Wacky Races games, and the comments section would seem to agree with me. The sheer amount of people that have told me to go and play the other PS2 Wacky Races game is getting a little out of hand, quite frankly. So I thought, you know what, to hell with Bug Snacks and Astro's Playroom, let's cover a bunch of Wacky Races games, shall we? Now, the always infallible, never been wrong before Wikipedia only lists five recognised Wacky Races games. Or should there be cheeky cheeky machine moo racing games? So I know there are Flash games and others on the Atari and such like, but for the sake of simplicity, these are the ones we're going to be focusing on. And the less said about the DC comic book spin off, the better. What the fuck is this, and why is Dick Dastardly making me question my sexuality? So our journey begins with Cheeky Cheeky Machine Moo Racing on the NES, originally released in 1991 and developed by Atlas. Yes, the Shin Megami Tensei and Persona Atlas. Given the quality they've gone on to create, it should come as no surprise that this game is actually really, really good. But it may come as a surprise that this game is a platformer. Yes, I'm not kidding. Wacky Races on the NES is an honest-to-god side-scrolling platformer. And I cannot tell you why that is. I was going to give Atlas the benefit of the doubt and say, hey, for the technology at the time, maybe a platformer was the best way to use the Wacky Races license. But... no. Excitebike came out in 1984, for Christ's sake. So did F1 Race, for that matter. And Micro Machines came out in the same year as Wacky Races and on the same system. What's going on here? No, you know what? I refuse to play this, actually. You can't make Wacky Races into a platformer. That's like turning Mario into a kart racer. <laughs> Alright, like turning Crash into a kart racer. <laughs> oh, for Christ's sake. Okay, Sonic. <laughs> Oh, fuck you, fine, I'll play it. So the game pits you as Muttley, sent out on a variety of errands by Dick Dastardly across three separate worlds, with three to four stages in each. There's ten stages in all, and each one ends in a boss fight against one of the Wacky Races crew in one of the strangest and most ridiculously endearing design choices I can think of in a licensed tie-in game like this. The idea that Dick Dastardly and Muttley are the heroes of this tale while they bomb the shit out of the two club-wielding Neanderthals is charmingly baffling. They're actually pitching Penelope Pitstop as a villain in this game. Yes, that Penelope Pitstop. The character that was so popular that she got her own spin-off series where she was constantly being hunted down by her guardian who wanted to kill her and take her fortune. Well, now she's trying to run over a dog. To be fair to Wacky Racers on the NES though, it does control really well. And for as absolutely stupid as the concept is, it's actually quite fun to play. By collecting bones throughout the stages, you can switch between one of your four power-ups to either replace or complement your short-range bite attack, including throwing bombs, gliding with your tail, a long-range bark attack, and an extra health point. On top of the power-ups, there's some pretty diverse and thematic backgrounds and locations to enjoy. The sound design is great, and it's a lot more forgiving than other platformers of its ilk with its death system, since you only get booted back to the beginning of the section you died on rather than being forced to restart the entire game again. This whole game is like if Mega Man was actually made for kids, rather than sadomasochists. I wish I had more to say about it, because it absolutely fascinates me on a number of levels. But I can't tell you any more than the footage is already showing you. It is a classic 2D side-scrolling platformer that makes bizarre yet brilliant use of a well-known license. And honestly, I'll probably go back and finish playing this at some point. It's nothing special, but for the sheer novelty, I'd recommend it to you. For now though, I think it's time we talked about an actual racing game in this Wacky Races video. So let's jump nine years into the future and revisit Wacky Races on the PS1, this time developed by Appaloosa Interactive, who also developed Echo the Dolphin. Incidentally, whoever I bought my copy of Wacky Races PS1 from, fuck you. 
The manual has a crease in it that was clearly made when someone folded it, and not even folded it in half, but folded only the left third of the booklet. Who folds a game manual? Just put it back in the case. It's the perfect size for a manual. It's safe in there. There's plenty of room for it. What earthly reason is there to fold one third of a PS1 manual, you fucking cretin? Oh, I'm getting distracted. Where was I? Oh, you are in for it now, square ass. Mechanically speaking, Wacky Race's PS1 is a fairly standard kart racer. Steer with the D-pad, accelerate with the X button, brake and reverse with triangle, and use your power-ups and weaponry with L2 and R2. There's no drifting or boosting a la Crash Team Racing, but it will take a certain level of concentration and ability to get good with, because the track design will necessitate different driving styles, which is perfect because each of these six racers in the game will have their own unique driving styles. But hold on there, Ross, I hear you cry. Six racers? Aren't there actually 11 wacky racers? Well, yes, there are, but in this game's biggest letdown, only six made the cut. I'm not entirely sure why that is, or what justification there was for cutting the Ant Hill mob, the Red Max, Luke and Blubber Bear, Rufus Roughcut and Pat Pending, especially when the Red Max appears in the banner in the start menu, but there we are. By default, you have access to Penelope Pitstop, the Creepy Coop, Peter Perfect, the Slag Brothers, it's a metalurgy term, look it up, and the Army Surplus Special. But you can also unlock the Meme Machine by completing all the various cup tournaments. Something that I'm yet to do in the year I've owned this game, because it can be absolutely fucking cutthroat at times. I mentioned earlier that you can use L2 and R2 to use your power-ups, and that's because there are actually two different kinds that you can carry with you at any one time. Mobility gadgets and bonus weapons. The mobility gadgets cover things like your speed, grip, temporary invincibility, an autopilot that's disguised as a character-specific gimmick like Penelope's parasol, and a police siren that you can use to trick other races into slowing down for you. How clever's that? Your weaponry can vary from beehives that unleash an angry swarm on the poor sod that drives into it, to a fallen tree that can just drop from the heavens in front of a speeding car, and another character-specific gimmick like Peter Perfect's spring-loaded boot and the dragon from the Creepy Coop's Belfry. Everyone gets access to these two weapon slots, which can create some of the most chaotic, vindictive and competitive races I've ever engaged in. And while it can be a little arduous when you're getting hit by a seemingly endless stream of them, I cannot tell you how satisfying it is to be able to bop someone on the head seconds before the finish line. Yeah, take that dick dastardly, you sexy bastard. The track design doesn't fall short of character either, because not only does it love to make you look like an absolute tosser by tricking you with false tunnel panels, but they are stuffed with shortcuts, alternate routes, and plenty of visual diversity. They all feel like natural environments that just happen to have a road system within them that makes for a great racetrack, and considering the show was just a cross-country race without a defined track, I think they've done a great job capturing that feeling here. Even in the most varied and complicated of courses though, you're never left to second guess which direction is correct, or how to navigate yourself back to safer surroundings. You get little rally type turning prompts for a start, but there are very few alternate routes that aren't immediately obvious which way you need to go. They're not always to your advantage, but that's the joy of experimentation. It's a great little optional risk and reward system, and you can either stick to the path and just rely on your turning and your power-ups, or you can try and take a riskier route and see how it pans out. What I would say though is that this game can really show its age in some places. You can find yourself getting caught on jagged edges and hitboxes that are way too broad for the object you're trying to navigate around, which can cost you valuable seconds if you start accelerating around an object you think you should be clear of, only to get caught by a fat block of impregnable nothingness. But yeah, I mean, look, for a PS1 racing game, I can't be too harsh on wacky races. It's a bummer that half the roster is missing, sure, and the hitboxes can really screw you over sometimes, and it's definitely not the most skillful racing game out there, but it's still a really enjoyable time. Is it just me though, or is the scaling a little balked in this game? These models look absolutely fucking tiny, is this cave 50 feet tall, or am I racing Hot Wheels? Well, who cares? That's what I always say anyway. After all, the next game we're looking at released on the PS2 seven years later, and it has all the races in it this time. I cannot wait to see how far the Wacky Races series has come. Who developed this one? Oh. Satan did. Now, if you're not familiar with Blast, all you really need to know is that this studio made the critically panned Little Britain video game that was banned in Germany for offering gameplay rewards for homophobic behaviour. No, I'm not making that up. Blast Entertainment have basically built their name on buying well-known TV and movie licenses, and then churning out the cheapest, most stripped-back, uninteresting, minimum-effort skid marks they possibly can. And then they make their money back from well-intentioned fans of these franchises that just don't know any better. 
This winking bomb is a death knell for any game that bears it on its cover, and I wish beyond reason that I stopped to look at who developed Mad Motors before I picked it up on eBay last year. This was the first Wacky Races game I ever played, and talk about a wretched introduction to the world of Wacky Races games. So Mad Motors opens up with a pretty well animated, albeit grainy intro sequence. Except it doesn't, because this is the intro cinematic to Wacky Races on the PS1, and Mad Motors doesn't even have one. They couldn't even be bothered to open this game up with the intro from the actual cartoon. Thanks Blast, you fucking fun sponges. In memory of Richard Joseph. Yeah, I'm sure he's fucking thrilled. So here's the main menu. It doesn't have an arcade mode or anything similar. It just has the campaign, time trials, and checkpoint races. None of which are any good. The campaign sort of acts like your arcade mode, but you have to qualify for the next race in the queue before you can access it. Which means that right out of the box, there's only one track and three races unlocked, which is almost unthinkable. Imagine if CTR only had Crash Cove, Crash, Coco and Cortex unlocked when you first put the disc in. So the first thing I notice is that none of these racers have stats apparently. There's four stat bars, but none of them have any measurable difference. So I assume they all race in the exact same way? The next thing I notice are these tokens on the left here. Dastardly tokens that allow you to unlock new characters when you collect enough of them, and wrench tokens that allow you to amend cart stats. You see, for a reason that I will never be able to discern, Blast decided that instead of individual cart stats, they'd let you amend the stats for all of the racers at the same time. So if you pour all of your tokens into traction, like I did, this will apply to all racers in the game, and not just the racer you were hovering over when you upgraded the stat. But the craziest thing is, these carts do actually handle and control differently when you race as them. The Army Surplus Special, for example, is way heavier in the turns than the Arkansas Chuggabug. So why do they all feel different with no way to figure out which one best suits your playstyle? And yet, if I upgrade traction to fix the issue I have with the Army Surplus, I can't invest speed into the Bouldermobile, which is what that desperately needs. This system is completely flawed, and I don't understand who thought this was a good use of those wrench tokens. Then again, it's hardly the most important issue here, because look at these fucking races. I don't even know where to begin. This is by far and away the least enjoyable kart racer I've ever played. And given I've played Cubics Race and Robots, that's saying something. There's a good second delay to every single button input here. Turning, boosting, braking, reversing, everything but accelerating in fact. And the heaviness and the stickiness of the controls just make some of these tight turns unmanageable. If you spin out at any point or crash, you are done for. Because the time delay on reversing gives your opponents a massive window to just speed past you while you're trying to get yourself back on the road. This also makes collecting the tokens in each course completely intolerable as well. Because if you miss one of the third type of tokens in this game, called the wacky tokens, and have to stop and reverse or spin around to collect it, that's it. Race over. There's no catching up with the people in front of you. The rubber banding and the AI are that badly broken. But you may be thinking to yourself, well, just don't collect the wacky tokens then. Except you can't ignore the wacky tokens. Because in the absolute worst aspect of Mad Motors, you can't qualify for the next race if you don't collect all eight of the wacky tokens in each level. Doesn't matter if you win, if you have anything less than 8 out of 8 wacky tokens, you ain't qualifying. In fact, the game puts such a heavy emphasis on these tokens that you can finish as low as 3rd in the race and still qualify for the next one, so long as you've collected all 8 wacky tokens. So in a car racing game all about a TV series based on a cross-country racing tournament where the participants are so desperate to win that they'll attempt to kill each other in order to achieve victory, you don't even need to win the races to progress. You just need to collect these pointless tokens that don't unlock new races like the Dastardy tokens, or upgrade your carts like the Wrench tokens. These are mandatory, can't miss, collect or fail tokens that do nothing except unlock the next track in the campaign mode. And even if you finish first with one token missing, you have to replay the entire track all over again battling against these painful controls and these bland, but ugly tracks that all look exactly the fucking same. There's no commentary, there's no dialogue, no banter between the racers, no shortcuts, no interesting track design, no anything. Your only hope of making any progress in Mad Motors is to fob the first race off entirely, focus solely on collecting the wrench and dastardly tokens so you can level up your cart, and then go back in, collect all the wacky tokens on your first lap, and then just boost your way around the track from starting line to finish line. And then you just have to pray to God that no one bumps into you or spins you out. The collision physics here are absolutely fucking atrocious. One bump and you're a goner, because they'll spin you out, leave you to fumble around correcting yourself with these delayed inputs, and by that time everyone has passed you by. 
You hear this noise here? That's the sound of me desperately trying to use my boost and the game resetting the sound effect over and over because I'm physically attached to the car beside me. And you're not getting any rubber banding support here kiddos. You fall behind and Blast are leaving you to the wolves you dumb bitch. But if you start pulling ahead of someone? Oh fuck we can't have that, we'd better have some inverse rubber banding in place to make sure the people behind you never fall too far behind. We don't want to risk people actually beating our game. This whole experience smacks of a lazy developer that's never made a kart racer before. The wacky token tokens are just padding to add an extra few hours of length to the gameplay, and the AI and the complete lack of rubber banding make this one of the hardest racing games to actually win. There's only one power up too, no missiles, no traps, no anything. Just a speed boost canister that might as well not be there because you barely ever seem to gain ground on your opponents when you use it, and even if you do pass them, they just rubber band back in front of you again. Thanks Blast, you fucking flaccid turd hammers. I am not exaggerating when I call this one of the worst games I have ever played and one of my least favourite games of all time. The only redeemable feature of Mad Motors is the fact that all 11 wacky racers are available to unlock and play as. But is that really any good to anyone when they don't talk, don't move, don't have unique weaponry like in the PS1 title, and when 8 of them are locked behind some of the worst races I've ever played where winning the race isn't even the priority? Mad Motors is dire, and if I were a man of god I'd work day and night to exercise the demons that possess this cursed disc and try to bring out the PS2 wacky races game that we all deserve. <gasps> Praise the Lord! So this is Wacky Races featuring Dick Dastardly and Muttley for the PS2. Yes comment section of my previous Wacky Races PS1 review video, it's finally happening! This game released in the same year as the PS1 game and it was developed and published by the same people too. Well, sort of. This one is published by Infogrames but developed by one of their localised studios. Infogrames Sheffield House. I guess this explains why the PS1 game didn't have all the races in it then. Infogrames were pushing two games for two different consoles and wanted the PS2 one to be superior, without skimping on the quality of the PS1 title. That makes a little bit more sense. Whatever the case, my expectations are sky high now. The same publishers overseeing an enhanced version of the PS1 game I already loved, not to mention fresh off of playing Mad Motors, this is going to be nothing less than perfect, I can feel it! Oh my god. Is that an adventure mode AND an arcade mode? Is that a difficulty setting? Are these camera controls? It gives me, I think they call it endorphins. What we have here is the polar opposite to Mad Motors, a PS2 and Dreamcast game built with an obvious love and passion for the series and for the video game medium, with the fans of the show at the heart of every design choice. First of all, how much better does this game look than Mad Motors? The cell shaded art style is the perfect choice for the Wacky Races series. And as with a lot of the old PS2 games that adopted this art style, it still holds up really well even after all this time. All the carts have this cartoony squishy look to them. It's most noticeable with something like the creepy coop, what with the way the belfry wobbles like a stack of jelly as you turn from side to side. I mean, yeah, the turbo terrific looks a little phallic, but that's what makes it fun. Speaking of the creepy coop though, one of the big issues I neglected to mention with Mad Motors was the way the taller carts took up way too much of the road. But unlike Blast Entertainment, Infogrames had a competent team of game developers, and decided to allow you to change the camera on the fly using the R2 button. So now you can adjust the camera to suit whichever cart you're racing on a case-by-case -case basis. We also have cart stats now so we can see who's better at what. And I have to say, this isn't the best feeling cart racer I've ever played, but it's very satisfying all the same. Now that we're all riding around in wibbly wobbly rubber Carts, the collisions are far more forgiving and feel way more understood than they did in Mad Motors. You can bump into other racers, fences, trees, petrol pumps, hell you can even accidentally veer into a lake and the race is far from over for you. It feels more like you're racing around in fairground bumper cars for the most part and it really helps add to that manic cartoonish feel. And oh yeah, you heard me right, petrol pumps, lakes, trees, there's actual variety in these tracks this time, how about that? Each of them has their own theme, their own set dressing, some are even based on the racers like your standard Boo Mansion or Cortex Castle. And much like its PS1 cousin, these all feel like natural road structures that just so happen to be perfect for racing in, which just feels so nicely tied back into the show. You've actually got a decent amount of content to play around with early doors too. Eight racers unlocked out of the starting gate, four or five tracks available to play in the arcade mode, with the ability to unlock a new track when you finish one of these in first place, and the adventure mode, which is where you're able to unlock what the game recognises as the three elite carts. 
Pat Pending's converter car, the Red Max in the Crimson Hay Baler, and the Mean Machine. You even get a little bonus round in the arcade mode where you'll randomly be offered the chance to race the Mean Machine in a one-off race around the track you've just unlocked. And this is a really brilliant way of teasing players with a high quality unlockable that entices you into getting better at the game so you can unlock it full time. There aren't any crates or floating power-ups this time either, just these wacky coins which sort of act like a currency. Collect enough of them and the three unique character-specific power-ups that you can map to your face buttons at the start of the race light up. And I actually prefer this system over the PS1 version. Now you've got an excuse to use each of these racers, because some have more defensive power-ups, some are more offensive, some have a nice blend, and no one gets the same ability as the other. When you factor in the experimentation with the racers and their stat spreads and their weaponry, plus the three unlockable characters and power-ups in the adventure mode, and the time trials, there's a lot more content in this one. If I had to nitpick though, I'd say that some of these tracks can be a little too creative for their own good. And when the action is coming at you thick and fast, it's all a bit too easy to miss a right turn signal and end up facing the wrong way. I appreciate I'd understand the layout pretty well after 4 or 5 goes around, but if I need to practice 15 laps to fully appreciate how to navigate your track, I think you've done a pretty poor job of signposting. But overall, I guess the comments section was right. This is easily the best Wacky Races game we've played so far, and the complete antithesis of Mad Motors in every possible way. In fact, Infogrames have got you covered here with two great Wacky Races games, and Atlas even pulled a rabbit out of the hat with their platformer. Three quality titles, one dud, and the book is closed. That's it everybody, show's over, let's go home is what you might have expected me to say, but I'm not done yet. So here we go, the final Wacky Races console game, Crash and Dash for the Wii. This box art's a bit shit, isn't it? These two don't look evil. They look like they're about to start singing a Backstreet Boys song. I want it that way. Now, I've had a bit of experience with Wii games on this channel, and so far I have a perfect record for absolute trash that could only have released on a big white brick. But damn it, I'm jazzed. Wacky Races PS2 was an absolute belter, so I'm feeling optimistic again. And hey, it's published by Eidos, the publishers of Lara Croft, Arkham Asylum, Lego Star Wars. I feel like I'm in safe hands here. Oh, Jesus fucking Christ. So Wacky Races Crash and Dash came out two years into the Wii's life cycle, and you know what that means. Forced motion controls. You navigate the menu with the Wii Remote, choose your character in one of the most unintuitive character select screens I've ever seen, choose your track, and then you're on your way to hell. If you couldn't already tell, the two main gimmicks in this game are crashing and dashing. To dash, you need to flail your Wii Remote from side to side like you're a five-year-old waving goodbye to your nan, and then you get a little extra burst of speed. You can't do it all race though, because your ability to dash depends on how well you filled your cog meter, which automatically fills as you race. The rest of the steering is performed with the joystick on the nunchuck, and you might think this looks fairly easy to control. But if you do, you clearly haven't played a Wii game in a while. This 2.5D side-scrolling thing they've gone for is horrible. I have no way to judge the depth of the road I'm racing on when I'm in this side view camera angle. And with all the characters bundled together in one screen, it's almost impossible to overtake someone without just waggling the Wii Remote and hoping the dash bursts you past them. Even worse, when the camera flips to the Micro Machines-esque overhead camera, you lose the main benefit of the side camera, which is being able to see what's coming up ahead of you, in exchange for better depth perception and an easier time seeing how wide the roads are. After a while though, you reach the crash portion of Crash and Dash, where you hit a certain checkpoint on the course and a cutscene triggers with Dick Dastardly and Muttley. A kind of cute little animation then runs, showing the do-badders messing with the cars, blowing up a bridge or laying some kind of trap. And then you get thrown into some of the most unclear and confusing minigames you will ever play. But the funny thing is, there's absolutely no punishment for messing up these minigames so far as I could tell. If you win them, sure, you get another power-up to use in the race, which by the way can also be another contrived motion control minigame that often bear no semblance of intelligent thought. But even if you fail, you respawn back on the track in the same position as you entered the minigame. More to the point, this is a minigame kart racer hybrid where three quarters of the racing you do has no bearing on the outcome. You'll eventually reach the final stretch, and you just have to wave your Wii Remote like an idiot again and try to boost your way to the finish line to win the race. Which means that all the racing you do between the starting flag and the final stretch are just to collect cogs and dash energy so you can expend it all at the final checkpoint. At that point, why bother trying to shoot other racers? Why bother trying to overtake them? Why bother with any of the racing? Just try and wrap your head around the minigames, save your cogs, and burn through them all on the final stretch. And furthermore, what the fuck is this auto-scrolling camera? 
If you fall behind, this game just abandons you for three seconds. It'll respawn you back on screen if you don't get back on within the time limit, but do you know how absolutely hopeless you feel when you're scrambling around these 2.5D sections trying to keep up, waggling your Wii remote like a castaway waving a flare, and then you just disappear off screen and the game just has to haul you back onto the race because you couldn't keep up with its camera? This is just so unrewarding and unpleasant to play. It feels like it's fighting you in every aspect of its design. There's more charm put into this game than Mad Mode, for sure, and I can tell there was some effort put into this thing, but its mechanics all just work against each other and you never really feel like this is a competitive race. There's no sense of achievement or success here, all you get is arm ache and annoyed. If you're going to make a 2.5D racing game, make the tracks wider to accommodate the number of cars. If you're going to make the tracks cramped, give me an overhead camera so I can navigate everything properly. If you're going to force Wii Motion into a racing game in any other way than the Wii Wheel from Mario Kart, then fuck you. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is that. A comprehensive rundown of the five console Wacky Races games that honestly, I don't know how to feel about them as a collection. For the longest time, I never knew there were Wacky Races games. And I always thought, man, wouldn't that be a really easy series to make a game out of? But Mad Motors in particular is such an ungodly mess that it makes me feel like an idiot for ever having dreams. The Wacky Races heyday is well and truly over. It was a smash hit when it came out in 1968, but I think a lot of its casual fans don't realise that it only ran for a single season. Season. The games industry did it justice in the 90s and early noughties with the NES, PS1 and PS2 and Dreamcast games, primarily I suspect because the developers of those games had grown up with wacky races and wanted to make something they'd have loved to have played when they were kids. But both Mad Motors and Crash and Dash are cut from the same cloth. They are low effort cash grabs, made to try and catch the eye of nostalgic fans of the series who happen to own one or both of two of the most popular consoles of all time. The Boomerang reboot of the Wacky Races series was a commercial flop and was quietly cancelled in 2019. And that could well be the bookend for this series, unfortunately. And so ends our wild ride through the world of Wacky Races games. I guess that means we can turn our attention back to the new PS5 and Xbox launch titles. Oh Jesus, has anyone got a spare kidney I can sell?